time I was on stage, I was 13 years old, and I was a frog. <laughs> anyway, I want to tell you about the worst compliment I ever received. My lovely friend Ian said that the thing that he most admired about me is that I am so dogged. Not the most flattering image, but he's right. You see, I'm dyslexic, and in order for me to acquire the basics of reading, writing, and spelling, I just had to be dogged. I was a bubbly child, but the daily failures and humiliations of school almost destroyed every bit of confidence I had. But, being dogged, I tentatively went back into education so that I could prove I wasn't stupid and try and figure out why I was failing. By the time I'd reached my 40s, I'd rebuilt enough confidence to embark on a full-time degree. But to my horror, I started experiencing flashbacks to the emotional humiliations I'd experienced as a child. Nobody should come out of education with post-traumatic stress disorder, or as I like to call it, post-traumatic school disorder. <laughs> being dyslexic is a little bit like being Usain Bolt and being judged on your ability to run a marathon. And just as he's not good at marathon running, and he's not built for it, we dyslexics are not good at the fast acquisition of reading, writing, and spelling, which is exactly the task we face when we first get to school. Hi, this is Sherry. She has been my dyslexic tutor here at Central for the last two years. A frog, you say? <laughs> my first time on stage was as a wolf, eight years old in Denmark. But anyway, my dyslexia has been a challenging companion. My dyslexia has both helped and hindered me in my professional and personal life. But the main emotion that has followed me is shame. The shame and frustration of observing people reading the words I had put down on paper, seeing the confusion in their eyes, and hearing their forgiveness in my words read back to me. Realizing that my words on paper doesn't reflect my thoughts or how I see myself. So something needed to shift, so the fear of shame didn't take me back to my 16-year-old self, full of anger and confusion. When people are faced with a 40-year-old <coughs> man behaving like a teenager, their misinterpretation can fuel their own <coughs> fear and confusion, which can derail an effective learning collaboration. It's been fabulous working with Christian. And we've learned an enormous amount from each other. But in order to contextualize that for you, I need to walk you through what I have learned. We dyslexics are more than able to tackle the written academic format and all that that entails. But there's also um, software that can help you capture your thoughts, read for you, uh, correct your grammar and spelling. There are apps that can help you organize your uh, research. Many of these are now free. The possibilities are endless, exciting, and liberating. Creative, adaptive, and innovative thinking is a real advantage in our fast-changing technological world. And it's exactly these skill sets that we are suppressing with the current way 
we deliver and assess learning. And it's these dyslexic thinking skills that are our strengths. These, some of these strengths are captured in the book, The Dyslexic Advantage, and the authors group them into the following four categories. Category one is enhanced 3D reasoning. This is the ability to hold an entire building or machine in your head and, and make a connection between all of the relationships. The second category is interconnected reasoning. This is the ability to make unusual connections between disciplines that are not necessarily linked, a great academic skill. The third category is dynamic reasoning. This is the ability to make best fit predictions with limited information. An example of a best fit prediction would be being able to see possible issues with your planned trip to Mars without having all of the facts at your fingertips. And finally, we have narrative reasoning. This is the ability to understand the world and how it works through stories. Think Steve McQueen, dyslexic, Turner Prize winner, and the director of 12 Years a Slave. Dr. Catherine Hewlett, in her PhD research into how dyslexic artists think, suggests that it is a flowed movement within a multi-dimensional conceptual framework. Working with Christian on his Master of Fine Arts in Movement Direction, has opened up some of the exciting possibilities of what an alternative to the written format could look like. I'm going to talk you through my process by showing you my dyslexic thinking through the alternative assessment format I used for my MFA. I'm good at creating visuals, the old school way on paper with a pen. I learn and think through the physical process of creating these visuals. Hieroglyphs and runes were there before the written word, so what I am doing is potentially a bit retro. But anyway, the challenge was to merge this with the existing academic requirements. In my head, in the beginning, there is this. A cacophony of images, textures, and sounds molding the base image. Don't worry, I am going to talk you through these images. We dyslexics are big picture thinkers. So this first image comes all at once, fully formed with pathway to the past, present, and future. This whole image create, creates the first anchor point for me to start identifying my thoughts on alternative assessment. I was a teenager in the 90s. So for me, alternative means grunge, nirvana, progressive music, and generally not following the norm. This might not have anything to do directly with the question I'm trying to answer, but by identifying these unusual connections in this first draft helps me settle into a structure I can start decoding in this second draft. This is also an example of the interconnected reasoning that Sherry was talking about earlier. I look at these images and ideas from a multiple perspective, like the compound eye of a fly, and that's why I really need the images to anchor me. Just like Alan Turing, another dyslexic, was breaking the Enigma code. So do I use these images to decode what and how I am thinking? 
I then break down the images into slightly more bite-sized elements of a more linear academic format for the viewer. I add text to the image to create anchor points for the viewer so that they also have something familiar to hold on to. This also allows me to create firmer visual boundaries around my academic thinking. This process of distilling structure is a way of allowing people into my understanding or dyslexic narrative reasoning. These building blocks become the foundation for the collaboration with my tutors. It's also at this point that the academic reading really starts. I now evaluate the best fit prediction about the topic made with my big picture understanding of the subject matter against what the academic literature is saying. Over the last two years, uh, I have identified that this process is part of my way into academic thinking. Without this physical process of drawing and creating visuals, my academic work makes little sense, most of all to myself. But why should any of you care about this? Because of the huge social implications of not responding to other ways of learning. Disenfranchised learners are overrepresented in statistics on mental ill health, substance abuse, <coughs> suicide, and prison, which is a shameful waste of talent. And it's costing us all money that we could much be, be much better spent on developing that talent in the first place. Researchers at the Cass Business School suggest that the UK is losing a billion pounds a year through disenfranchisement in education. Disenfranchisement happens when the system does not reflect you or your learning. When Christian looks at his work, and sees his process reflected back at him, it creates a transformative engagement with his learning. So when thinking about alternatives to the written format, why don't we ask the people who are working in this dynamic way already, the dyslexics themselves? Mainstream education is faced with a rise in websites, offering essay writing services for a fee or to you and me, cheating. The Quality Assurance Agency suggests a way to address this is to consider a mixture of assessment methods. It is difficult to fake an assignment where your face is filmed, where your creative process is documented, where your voice is narrating an interactive PowerPoint presentation like this. This slide is the equivalent of a paragraph, a drawn paragraph. On the left, we have the written underpinning of the idea that supports the academic nature of the visual. The visual is furthermore supported by two voice recordings, the blue narrating the actual text on the image. The red speaker unpacks the information capturing the academic underpinning of my visual. For example, looking at the image, we have a small and a big star. The big star represents Laban's planes, a key to my understanding that there is a physical process in my preferred learning style. With all of these elements, including writing, as we don't want to leave it out in the cold, it just needs to share a bit of the limelight. We end up with stronger and more inclusive academic work. What we have come up with is not bulletproof yet, but let's face it, the written uh, dissertation has a bit of a head start, and it's about time we challenge this. 
We think that through collaboration and a flexible mindset from both the dyslexic student and the academic establishment, we can together create a more equal academic exchange in a mutual learning environment. After all, no two students think alike. I just wanted to add that this work for me is alive and keeps <coughs> evolving, as I am sure the written work does for most of you. These visuals has also transformed my ability to communicate as a movement director. Ted Fellow and Greek lecturer, Dr. Atul Gawande says that it is no longer possible for us to know everything. And in order to build better systems, we need to draw on specialist expertise and build effective teams. It would not have been possible for me to support Christian with his MFA or for Christian and I to present this talk without working as a team and building on each other's expertise. For me, the most important element in this broadening of academic work is finding new ways to communicate and learning from each other. This will take courage from all sides to reform, fail and try again. I have been lucky and I mean lucky. Without the courage of the institutions and the individual of embracing the challenge and uncertainty of exploring new ways of working and what that could look like. So without teamwork and the support of the system, we would be nowhere. So, and this is not only for the dyslexic student, but for everyone with the courage to rethink learning. Thank you.